Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. This character was developed in 03. I have one that was made in 99. This character is played for three months, three days, and three hours. That's my bow character. And what's the, the name again? And that's Blackheart, and Moss Zapper is the one that was created in 1999. I've, I've uh, created friends from England, uh, New York, uh, all, all over the States. It's a great game. Do you have any funny moments or favorite moments you've had with this game? Yeah, at the beginning, I have to lie down in order to heal. Uh, the game has come a long way. Uh, and I've had a lot of fun playing. Do you think you'll be able to find a game similar to this one? Did you check out anything else? No, I don't, I, everything that looks like crap compared to this game. <laughs> <laughs> MMOs are more than just a video game. They are a community of people that spend hundreds of hours of their lives in some sort of fantasy setting. There's something downright creepy about the fact that with a push of a button, something you've spent hundreds of dollars on and in some cases, decades of your life in, could just disappear without any alternative and no means of preservation. In most of the cases we'll explore today, these games were shut down for no good reasons, and any efforts to preserve them are actively being thwarted by the companies that hold an iron grip on their intellectual property, effectively making some of these once large homes into lost media. But before I get into the actual video, I want to tell you about the fine folks at Amino who has offered to sponsor this video and is allowing me to create some new creepy content for you guys. With their new feature, Amino Stories, you can find a bunch of fun, informative, creepy content that won't be affected by YouTube's demonetization bot prevalent right here on my home of YouTube. If any of this sounds interesting to you, please click the link in the description or pinned in the YouTube comment section or to search up Amino apps. If you would like to find my stories, try searching that creepy reading, as seen here on screen. I'm going to be posting new videos there, like this one about the Paris Catacombs Lost Man footage, which is the story about a man who got lost deep in the depths of the Paris Catacombs and presumably died. But there's some interesting stuff I'd like to tell you guys there, so please give it a look. I also like the Paranormal Amino, which hosts quite a bit of fun stuff to navigate through that I've noticed a few of my other friendly content creators have been adding to. For interesting new creepy content that simply will not be able to make any money on YouTube, consider going to my Amino page. With that said, please sit back, relax, and prepare to be scared as I present 9 dead but not forgotten MMORPGs. Wildstar began as a promising title, showing potential in its uniquely satisfying combat and an art style which oozed with personality. And considering that this is a product of ex-World of Warcraft devs fond of the classical era of WoW, it's easy to see why this game was hyped so much. In fact, it makes this entry particularly difficult to talk about given that it's a game that has a lot in common with my MMO of choice, Guild Wars 2. Not only did Wildstar release just two years after Guild Wars 2, but it had many of the shared systems, such as a focus on exploration and innovative combat that Guild Wars 2 pioneered. This early launch was met with praise and quickly amassed a player base of 
hardcore players, which had been following the title since it was announced in 2011. Just when the MMO seemed to have everything going for it, there was a dip in player base, eventually leading to a change in the game subscription model, becoming free to play instead. This only managed to bandage the problem for a short while until NCSoft decided to do what it does best, laying off over 70 members of the development team without notice. Job security? Well, I wouldn't know what that is. I mean, I work on YouTube. On a more depressing note, in 2018, it was finally revealed that Wildstar would be shutting down. Despite performance issues on launch, Wildstar featured its own unique take on a telegraph-based combat system. This made the titles hardcore raids fun and engaging, but only if you were willing to contend with the attunement system that was prominently featured in Classic WoW and felt archaic to some players. Since the PvP systems felt clumsy and awkward, and warplot battles were decided by whoever had more friends online at a time, Wildstar lived and died on its raids. Wildstar was also unique in the sense that it was one of the first new wave MMO titles to offer player housing and the option to create entire cities within the game space. Which is just insane. Of course when you offer this much creativity to the average player in a world ripe with fun, interactive lore, casual and role players tended to flock in droves. However, considering even the dungeon content was catered more to the hardcore players, these people tended to get underserved. Producing high quality raid content would be difficult enough considering the sheer number of layoffs in the studio. But the development team also was stretched thin trying to improve the other game modes, which were lackluster since the start. This eventually slowed content down to a drip, drying up both gameplay the raiders came for and the story the role players needed to thrive. With the resources so limited, it became impossible to provide content that would cater to both of the two remaining audiences, and soon enough, once the influx of free-to-play players began to dwindle, the player base began to die out. Faced with a decline in revenue, NCSoft shut down the game in 2018. But not without a few final months of events to properly send off this game with a bang. Old seasonal bosses returned, the Pro Star Gala Winterfest extravaganza came back for one final shopping frenzy. And finally, on November 8th, the developers asked the players to join them in the game for the last few final hours before the servers were shut off permanently. Watching the caretaker address the player base, those few final times, it's like watching the pulse of a loved one slowly decline. The countdown timer shows no signs of stopping. 30, 30 minutes left before complete and total annihilation. Uh, we better start saying our goodbyes, I suppose. Oh my. Oh my. The countdown timer is now at 15 minutes. It just won't stop. How frightening, yet exciting. I must say, it's been a pleasure working with you adventurers. Won't someone hold me, dear? You all look so loved. It almost brings a tear to my holographic eye. Network error. Connection closed. And just like that, Planet Nexus disappeared forever. And everyone in Wildstar's vibrant, loved, dedicated community lost their home. In 2005, Mythic Games secured the license to produce Warhammer Online from Games Workshop, which would release in 2008. 
This release year was also the 25th anniversary of the Warhammer franchise, making it a dense IP packed with lore from games, novels, and more. It's also worth noting that after the game was announced, but before it was released, Mythic was acquired by EA Games in a merger which would help to fund the project. Despite this acquisition, the creative development lead, Paul Barnett, helped to create a game that was still in the spirit of the Warhammer franchise. It was said that his passion for Warhammer was so intense that discussions with Paul could evangelize those who had never even heard of the franchise before. Warhammer Online was intended to be the successor to Mythic Games' previous PvP-centric MMO, Dark Age of Camelot. Warhammer Online's PvP system boasted an intuitive realm versus realm system which allowed the game's myriad of unique roles and classes to shine. There were even PvP-focused servers which allowed brutal competition to break out anywhere not controlled by NPC guards. These PvP systems also highlighted the conflict between factions in the Warhammer universe, creating an experience which was not only accessible, but rich in the franchise's lore and personality. Warhammer Online was also the MMO to revolutionize public questing, giving incentive to players who join forces without the need to form traditional groups. Two years after the release, however, EA Games had cut the studio's workforce by a third and Warhammer Online wasn't meeting the same subscription base that Dark Age had garnered. Failed attempts to revitalize the game included a content patch which included playable Skaven for both Order and Chaos factions, and a half-hearted attempt to introduce monetization which would shift the game to a free-to-play model. Still, the number of servers continued to decline, and by 2013, EA had come to an agreement with Games Workshop and the owner of the Warhammer franchise to to shut down Warhammer Online. If the game were still around today with its exceptional creative direction which truly evoked the spirit of the Warhammer fantasy, there's no doubt in my mind that it would still be appreciated by the Warhammer metalheads still gathering in game stores and traditional game threads. Truly, there hasn't been a game quite like it since. The original Secret World was an amazing game that took the conventional MMO story and tried to innovate and change it into something completely different. Yeah, the Secret World Legends is still technically playable, however with a player base of anywhere from around 2 to 300 people concurrently, it's really hard to say that it's still breathing. Not to mention, Secret World Legends is simply not the Secret World. It's like what would happen if suddenly your best friend was replaced with an absolute stranger and nobody but you noticed. Time of death, July 31st, 2017. The original Secret World was not known for having the best combat, but what it did have was freedom of choice and no real leveling system. Used weapons gained experience and leveled up weapon types to create a playstyle that you personally enjoyed. Furthermore, the storytelling in the game did not hold your hand. Many quests required you to interact with the world and really pay attention for you to get where you needed to. Similar to playing Elder Scrolls Morrowind. It wasn't uncommon when playing this gem to have a wiki up on one screen and the game in the other. To top it all off, it had a very mature story which included lots of vulgar language and true reimaginings of classical horror icons. Content began to slow to a crawl and eventually one day it just stopped coming. Players began to question when the next chapter was even going to come out. Eventually it was announced that the game was going to be revamped into the wolf in sheep's clothing that we have now. An immersion breaking leveling system was introduced, traditional classes replaced the freeform playstyles that people were used to, and a whole new level of grind was introduced which could of course be bypassed with money. Combat became a frustrating and even more spammy affair, and a once unified community turned against each other as people would split between those who just wanted the new content and would justify every terrible decision made, and those who remembered and preferred what the game used to be like. Between the cut content, loss of good writing, and the death of the community, The Secret World died on July 31st, 2017, only to be replaced with a legend that wasn't worth remembering. The Realm Online is one of the forefathers of the MMO as we know it today. It is also the mother of dead MMOs. Having launched in 1996 and dying around 2002, it's hard to find any hard numbers on what year the Realm Online peaked, but it's most likely somewhere around 1998. By the time the game had gained any steam, the Realm Online was already being overshadowed by its newer, sleeker, 
and more fine-tuned competitors, Ultima Online and EverQuest, which were games made possible due to the new available technology Pentium 2s and 3s. By 1999, the realm's graphics are starting to look outdated. Not to mention, the combat system felt more attuned to playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons. The combat was actually turn-based, as opposed to the action tab targeting everyone was becoming more fans of. The gameplay, the action, and the graphics were all lackluster, and due to these new kids on the block, this led to a player drop-off. Although diehard fans will say that the cartoon graphics added to the charm of the game. The true heart and soul of The Realm Online was its sense of humor about itself. It had that charm that only Sierra games like Space Quest, Leisure Suit Larry, and King's Quest could truly deliver on. It had a heavy focus on humor that dominated the 80s and 90s. Although not a direct genre parody like Space Quest or the video game equivalent of a boys club screwball comedy like Leisure Suit Larry, there was a sense that the realm online didn't take its fantasy setting or its lore very seriously, giving the player a sense that we're all here to just have fun and hang out. But as they say, fun comes at a price. A monthly subscription fee that would be equivalent to $20 to $35 a month in today's money. By around the year 2000, Codemasters went and taken over the realm online from Sierra and taking a cue from EverQuest, set out to try and refine the game into something a bit more profitable, and also into a more serious experience. As a consequence, they took out all the jokes that made the game's players fall in love with it to begin with. This drastically changed the tone of the game. Without that sense of self-aware humor, those few who chose to stay we're not going to stick around for a game with a cartoon graphic style that costs almost twice as much as now the more popular competitors. And they did not. Realm Online was a special place for many people. It was one of the first MMOs of a graphical interface that got people together for a fun, jokey fantasy adventure. It invoked classical point and click games from Sierra's catalog, and furthermore, it's one of the first lost and dead MMOs to hit the landscape. The first omen that many other people would lose their homes. Biggest one-man hype machine since Poochie the Dog. Bless Online. This is the perfect example of a game collapsing under its own hype. To call this game derivative would be an insult to derivative copyright law. This is World of Warcraft with a bad frame rate. Honestly, I want to say the graphics are genuinely terrible, but much like a wolf in sheep's clothing, looks can be deceiving sometimes. I mean, if you're not watching this in motion, it can be deceiving. If these were just screenshots sent off to various video game publications, we're gold. But playing this game, this is what it actually looks like when it's in actual motion. Now, I know with the rest of this list, we're lamenting the loss of various communities. However, with this game, there never was a community to begin with, even now, considering half of the total 141 people playing at the same time are bots. So why bring up this game? Well, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll let myself out. The death of this game breathed new life into other games in the market as uh, the mass exodus brought a huge boost in players to Black Desert, Guild Wars 2, and even World of Warcraft saw a bump in its player base. Because this game died, so many other communities saw new life, and you know what, considering you still have the option to play this train wreck, we can just call that a win. Uh, just never mind anyone who spent the $30 on the uh, Founders Edition. <laughs> Press F to pay respects, all right? A 
Originally launching April 27, 2004 and shutting down August 31st, 2012, City Heroes was beloved by its core community. So much so that when I did a poll on which superhero MMO I'd review in my series MMO Grinder, the City of Heroes community made absolutely certain that they'd win by casting over 500 votes for their game, despite DC Universe Online being the original frontrunner as it was the new kid on the block. They've also spent the last seven years trying to get this game back up in a playable state, which has just now become a reality. Yeah, the game's a bit aged, the models look like dolls, and the gameplay is very typical fare for its time, but what made this game stand out was its theming. You could patrol the city, log out in specific areas for your civilian job, and come back in with a bonus. You could choose to be not only a hero or a villain, but could slot yourself into the vigilante or rogue position, which was an intermediate place between hero and villain. What I'm trying to say is that this game lived and breathed the superhero story, and had a world that many people would love to RP in. It's a game that knew how to hook people into its world, and it really kept them there. The reason why it was shut down is actually kind of more complicated than it would seem. NCSoft took on two massive projects, and it was going up against Star Wars The Old Republic, one of the most expensive MMOs ever to be developed, while still funding Guild Wars 2 and Wildstar. City of Heroes was just never popular in Korea, and it failed to take hold, despite being completely profitable in the United States. However, the way the Korean stock market worked, City of Heroes was actually losing NCSoft more money than it was bringing in. The development studio behind the game wanted to keep making it. The players wanted to play it, and they even raised funds to try to buy the IP from NCSoft, yet it was just not meant to be. They even mailed cakes to NCSoft in an attempt to get them to see how much this game meant to them. But regardless of every effort made, they chose to shut it all down and left many people without a home. But years later, they revealed they now have a functioning private server, allowing anyone who wants to relive the old days with that community, and finally granting them a new home. Disney Interactive Games had always had a level of quality to their products. Whether you're talking about Disney's Epic Mickey or even the Kingdom Hearts franchise, these guys have always had a massive pedigree behind them. But did you know that these guys were also behind a few lesser yet more well-known games, such as Pirates of the Caribbean Online, Club Penguin, and of course the elephant in the room, Toontown Online. Club Penguin, when it was up, was pretty much a Flash-based social hangout area, with random Flash games added to spice up the proverbial chat room. Much like any community, there were random secrets and myths that the community focused on. I mean, who never tried to flip this glacier by doing, oh my god, it actually- Then there was Pirates of the Caribbean Online, which is a game I actually have some history with. I remember buying my own ship, leveling my own pirate, and spending way too much time on in-game gambling with Blackjack. At least I know how to play the game now. I played it with my cousin by calling him on my home phone, setting that to speaker while playing on my crappy family PC in the living room. You could use guns, voodoo dolls, staffs, and a bunch of bladed weapons I don't have time to get into. And finally, there was Toontown Online, a turn-based game set in a world of cartoons versus corporate overlords, which is kind of <clears throat> ironic considering where we're at now, Disney. Many people grew up on Toontown, and I remember playing this one with my mom. You had to use gags to fight these robot things called cogs and play mini games to get more money. Between the silly random generated names and the moderated chat filter, this was one of the most fun experiences for any child of the early 2000s to have, especially for those who weren't quite old enough for World of Warcraft or the other big name MMOs at the time. Well, that brings us to a new question. Why did these games shut down? Simply put, uh, stupid idiot corporate people at Disney. They tried to chase a trend and succeeded with Club Penguin, which caused these corporate overlords to see these costly other MMO universes based on their properties to be seen as competitors to their own products. So in response, they decided to stop updating anything that wasn't Club Penguin. And 
when these content updates slowed to a crawl, a lot of the user base started to leave. Even Toontown, which managed to retain its user base for years, was left in limbo for quite a long time before they eventually shut it down. Considering Disney Interactive oversaw all of these different MMOs, it's kind of hard to see how they could be expected to keep up with these different content cycles in these, mind you, subscription-based MMOs. So it was announced that considering Disney Interactive would be unable to maintain a level of quality with these games, that they would be dropping all of them to focus on other projects, specifically mobile experiences. Funnily enough, even with Club Penguin, which was eventually shut down to be converted into a mobile game they named Club Penguin Island, that too was shut down in early 2019, which means that all three of these homes were shuttered. And unlike Toontown, which could be rewritten into its own private server with minimal compromises to its overall quality, Pirates of the Caribbean Online will have a uphill battle as the game's story and universe is firmly rooted in this Disney property, which considering how litigative Disney lawyers can be, we all know that they won't let that thing go without a hard legal fight. So at the end of the day, we have all these games with all these different universes and player bases all getting shuttered because corporate people just don't understand video games. Lovely. Fusion Fall was, and still is, the greatest crossover MMO out there. I mean, there isn't much competition, but hey. This MMO is centered around heroes and villains teaming up to save the day. This gives an excuse to shoehorn in as many characters and shows from Cartoon Network as they can, all of which are iconic and beloved. We have Adventure Time, Courage, Regular Show, Ed Ed and Eddie, Dexter, and the greatest Cartoon Network show of them all, Johnny Test, all rendered in 3D, and some of which are given a very weird and slightly jarring anime art style. Finn is low-key terrifying. The gameplay is your standard affair. Complete tasks given you by NPCs, kill monsters and take on quests. Though gameplay is hardly ever a focus for the MMOs. It's about building a team of real players as you do the usual mundane tasks together. Though as every adult learns someday in life, nothing's free. How they get you is by giving you a choice of one of four characters, Ben Tennyson, Dexter, Double D, or Mojo Jojo. They'd be your guide for the first four levels. Playing past that required a monthly paid subscription. It was about standard, costing $12. The community was thriving all the way up to the game's closure on August 29th, 2013. The game had upwards of half a million players at the height of its popularity, even spinning off into a comic book series. The game was still hugely popular at its death, leading to Cartoon Network reworking the concept into Fusion Fall Heroes a few months later. People didn't take to it as well as the first, as they had changed it into a more MMO beat-em-up, somehow. The spin-off was shut down without notice, so an exact date couldn't be pinpointed. The game reportedly only had 1,200 or so users, never fully reaching the height of Fusion Fall's heyday. The fans of the original are still around, and a few devoted fans have created an unofficial revival titled Fusion Fall Retro so the game is still playable in some way. If you're interested or in the mood for a bit of nostalgia, go and download the revival. It's pretty accurate to the original. November 2nd, 1999 was the date Asheron's Call was released to the world. Honestly, for its time, it was pretty popular, as it was the third best-selling MMO of its era. Sitting comfortably below the still-played EverQuest and Ultima Online, Asheron's carved out a niche by being much more single-player friendly while also keeping its intense hardcore systems that made games like EverQuest popular. Turbine used actual collision detection as opposed to a tab targeting system, which means that every object, whether that's an arrow or a spell, was tracked and needed to be aimed. Sword swings could be aimed high, low, or in the middle, which means that if a creature was small, you had to aim lower, or sometimes it was more effective to hit a weaker point higher up. Depends on the enemy you are fighting. 
Spellcasting also had a bold system, where each spell had to be learned, and the more people on that server that knew that specific spell, the less effective the spell would be. So those who took the time to craft and learn and find new spells would have an advantage, adding a level of mystery and rarity to the whole mechanic, which was just not seen in any other game even today. What I'm saying is, for a game made in 1999, Azuron's call was genuinely special, and it's understandable why the final moments of the server's existence was so heartbreaking, especially for those who partook in his world. Despite this game being a diamond in the rough, the years were not kind. Because of how solo friendly the first game was, people did not form large and bright communities around it like we see with EverQuest. Furthermore, Asheron's Call 2 changed some of the core gameplay so that it was more group focused, which again split the player base and eventually killed both games. Warner Brothers briefly tried to resurrect Asheron's Call 2 in 2012, but in 2017 both games were shut down for good. This game featured a complicated system of friendship and betrayal due to its hardcore PvP system and fostered so many stories over the years. Even as the game was ending, due to companies not seeing the value in a property like this, people got together to mourn the loss of something that was so great and special in their lives. My heart goes out to those who lost their community. Games like this were never about the gameplay, it was always about the community and the people you played the game with, and not so much what the game actually was. It was a place where people could just come together, forget about the world, and share their lives, and now we're seeing it discarded and transformed into lost media with very little in the forms of restoration or preservation. Warner Brothers, if you hear this. I haven't played in three years, but I always do. I could come back to it. This was my home. <laughs> Please don't let it go away. <laughs> if somebody's buying it, please bring it back the same. Don't change anything. <sighs> Leave everything the same. Don't let Dareth go to waste, and all these people, and all their items, and everything that we've worked for, the friendships, and the relationships, and the marriages, and the kids, and the friends, everything that people have had. Don't let this go to waste. Thank you, everyone. Oh look, it looks like you made it to the end of the video. I would like to thank everyone who's made it to this point because it really means that you actually give a crap about what I'm doing on the stupid freaking internet. I also would like to thank all the Patreon people you see on screen now. Without these people, this would be significantly more stressful. Uh, because of the Patreon thing, I was actually able to afford video blocks just let me have access to stock footage and I hope you can see a noticeable improvement with this project. If you made it this far into the video and you decide to comment to make me feel better in knowing that you made it to this point in the video, feel free to call me GamerGirl19 cause of course I am the man of your dreams. Honest to god I love seeing people comment the same thing over and over again, especially when it means that they made it to the end of the actual video, it makes me feel a lot more safe and secure that I'm actually making content that people would like to watch. Patreon is more important now than ever considering that I am still looking for a second job so that I can maintain financial security. So please consider giving a donation and getting a special rank in my discord and maybe some art from my artist. The next video will either be most dangerous YouTubers, best Christmas specials that you wouldn't really think about, worst things from the furry community. Thanks for watching, and again, just watching the videos and being here supports me so much, and it really does mean a lot. See you next time.